kick off, I'd like to welcome Laura Turkington, Commercial Innovation Director within the Corporate Responsibility Team at EY, who will be co-moderating the first panel session with me in conversation with our judges. So before we welcome our panel, it would be great, Laura, if you could introduce EY's work in this space, uh, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on this year's MV100. Tom, it's an absolute honour to be here today and to celebrate the incredible Meaningful Business Top 100 winners and get the inside track from our esteemed panel of judges. So at EY, combining profit with purpose to drive long-term value for all our stakeholders is of utmost importance. Therefore, partnering with Meaningful Business is a wonderful opportunity for us to recognise the incredible efforts of these brave leaders who are doing just that. They are tackling some of society's most pressing issues to create a better future for everyone. At EY, we have an ambitious corporate responsibility program, namely EY Ripples, and we're committed to positively impacting the lives of 1 billion people by 2030. We believe that by sharing the skills, expertise and knowledge of our people on a non-profit basis, that we can create a meaningful difference to the world today. We have three focus areas where we believe we can make the biggest impact. First, supporting the next generation to build the skills and mindsets that they need to find and sustain meaningful work. Second, accelerating environmental sustainability. So helping to drive the adoption of behaviors, technology and business models that serve to combat climate change. And lastly, working with impact entrepreneurs, which of course is the most relevant here today. Last year alone, we were proud to say that we helped to support over 7,000 impact entrepreneurs on their journey to make measurable progress against the SDGs. And that was across 50 different countries. We offer our support here in many different ways from skills development to mentoring and coaching programs in which we match make EY people with impact entrepreneurs to address common barriers to growth. Through low bono consulting engagements in which EY people or EY teams dedicate themselves to social enterprises to help improve business resilience, productivity, and find new opportunities to scale. And lastly, we have a range of different digital tools and resources um, to help entrepreneurs across each and every stage of their journey. So we are really looking forward to hearing more about the experience of all the Meaningful Business winners and learning from them and also finding ways in which that we can collaborate with them to add value. Um, and so that, Tom, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this. Um, and I'm excited to meet the judges and hear what they have to say. Brilliant. Thank you, Laura. So let's, um, let's welcome them on, on to stage. Um, so we're, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Kimberly Geyer. Uh, board Chair for the Centre for Global Equality, uh, Mike Barry, Board Trustee at A Blueprint for Better Business, uh, Nuru Mugambi, Sustainable Finance and Investment in Africa Policy Expert, and Snigda Sahal, uh, the CEO of Action Against Hunger in India. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, and, and over to you, Laura, to, to kick off the discussion. Great. Well, I have the privilege of asking Mike. Uh, so, Mike, as someone who has worked in the profit and purpose space for a long time, uh, what were you hoping to see in this year's nominations and what really stood out for you? Well, well, I think there were three key things for me. One is, and I can say this, is the sheer diversity of the, of the applicants. Again, moving away from, the, from this world that I've come from, this sort of white male, grey-haired monoculture that led us nowhere. So seeing such a diverse range of participants in this has been brilliant. The second thing I took from it was impact, the sheer quality of the ideas. I see lots of awards where the sort of the ideas are not bad, but I don't feel they're transformational. This time I really felt transformation. And the third and final thing I saw was a pathway to scale. And again, I see lots of awards given to people who've done something really good, but it just sits there as one sort of individual intervention. What this um, judging panel, I think, saw was people who could bring scale to hundreds of thousands of of products or places or people to drive the change at the pace we need. So they're three big things I'm seeing, been great. Great, really encouraging. And, and Kimberly, I, I think that, that point around scale is, is something that you, you look at across your, your work with social entrepreneurs around the world. What, what do you see as some of the, the challenges that are facing these individuals right now? Yeah, so for me, I'm a former banker, a former treasury banker, so a banker's banker. and. 
one of the things that I see as the most critical is how we leave entrepreneurs to kind of navigate the funding space in a very fragmented way, which actually takes an enormous amount of time away from their core work. And many aren't able to continue because of that lack of um, certainty of funding. So I think we need to think together about other funding models. Challenge models are great, you know, to get grant money, but they're actually, they take an awful lot of time. Often it's just a small amount of money and they can't use it for their core sort of flex operations. And anyone who has designed a business or started a business themselves knows you, you, you need that flex and, and uh, opportunistic sort of pool of money to respond, to adapt. So I think we need to get smarter about the partners that we can bring together to create pooled funds and to recast what we mean by investment in social entrepreneurship. These Some of these models, particularly as you edge into the humanitarian and development space, are not tech unicorns. They are not profit-making models, but they are saving lives and saving money. And so I'll come to that later uh, on in my comments, but I really would like people to recast the lexicon and the way that we fund these entrepreneurs so that they can succeed. Yeah, makes, makes total sense. Um, Nuru, over to you. Um, what was really exciting to see this year was that Africa was the continent with the highest representation. Um, and I'm interested in your insights and how you've seen business as a force for good develop in Africa through the important work that you do. Thank you so much. Indeed, uh, we were really happy to see across the, the, all the categories quite a number of African entries. In my category, however, there weren't that many. So I was in planet focused. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll just, just talk br uh, broadly about um, what we're seeing in the, the, the topic that you're talking about or the theme around force for good. And I would say that um, when, I, when I looked at the subject for our, our panel, um, I, remind, I, remind, I remembered how we say that Africa um, is the birthplace. Uh, but at the same time, I was remembering um, this theme that necessity is the mother of invention. Um, so I was trying to think about the inventions that we are seeing coming through from Africa under the Meaningful Business uh, program. What can it teach the world? If necessity is the mother of invention and if Africa is the birthplace of civilization, what is it that we can teach the world? And indeed, there are very many pockets of entrepreneurs that are doing really interesting things, including leveraging on indigenous technology and cultural heritage. Um, and we're beginning to see some of that come through on the business side. So what I did see uh, in the entries, I think replicates uh, across the continent in terms of interesting innovations that pay a nod to the culture and the heritage. Also see a lot of innovative processes that can be deployed across multiple sectors. And I think that's a key thing that I wanna also encourage all the entrepreneurs that are with us today. How can we innovate not only for our sector, but multiple sectors? There were a number of entries that I saw had technologies that can be deployed in different sectors. Um, also what we're seeing is the mainstreaming of emerging topics. So things like autonomous vehicles that we saw in the entries, things like circular economy. There's so many examples on the continent. Again, necessity, we have so much waste on the continent. We have a lot of informal settlements, but we're seeing more trends around how do we, how do we aggregate waste? How do we leverage on digital technology and mobile phones, which are at the highest level of penetration on the continent than anywhere else? How do we leverage on more mobile technology to create systems, circular economy systems, waste management and recycling systems. Other emerging topics that I saw from entries that we're probably not doing as much on the continent is themes like natural capital accounting that I saw um, one, of the, one of the entrants uh, was introducing. So I'd like to see us learn from this cohort uh, and, and, and hopefully replicate, Mike talked about scaling. Um, and, and definitely one of the things we need to see more that I think as Africans we're very close to is the issue around social and social inclusion. Um, but I probably did not see as much around social inclusion and diversity. And Mike was talking about his, him being our diversity card, but more diversity uh, from an ethnic and cultural diversity perspective. 
and social equity and also persons with disabilities. I did not see that coming out strongly in the entries that I looked at. And, and that's something as Africans were very close to the social um, and we tie social with environmental. You can't talk about the environment without talking about human beings. And, and that's something I think uh, maybe Laura, as I pass back to you, I can say is a key thing that we need to remember. And COVID has reminded us that it's about people first before you talk about the planet. Thank you. Yeah echo that absolutely tom over to you yeah i mean and, and snig though through your work you're, you're very much focused on 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 the social um a, a action against hunger um and from your perspective in the humanitarian sector what's the best way that entrepreneurs in the private sector can can work with ngos like yours so um you know like any any successful collaboration i think the key is how are you leveraging each other's strengths uh, so what happens is that the private sector has a lot of risk appetite. They have capital, they have um, innovations, they have ideas. Humanitarian sector has feet on the ground, insights from the grassroots. They have the pulse of the community. And when you, if you marry them together, then it's definitely going to be successful. But what on almost always happens is money is the, you know, is the pain point because uh, like in India, we don't have, we, our laws would not allow us to take the services um, from a private um, service provider like that if, if the money is a donor funded money. Um, similarly, if, if I think, I, if I still go ahead and do that, I will not be able to afford that kind of pricing because they are startups. They haven't yet come down to a pricing which is you know, which is affordable by a common person or an NGO. So I think, I think this is a great time when you can put three people together, someone who can fund something like that, who understands that, you know, it's okay to take these risks. It's okay to bet on uh, some of these great, intelligent, smart, uh, innovative people like we saw in the entries and then someone who can actually deliver it on the ground. Uh, I haven't seen too many of these combinations, but it is my dream that I, at some point in my life, I am able to, you know, like get everything together and be the person who who get who gets it on the ground. But yeah, yeah, it's a wish. It, I hope that it happens sometime. Uh, I think, Kimberly, that that plays back into kind of what you're saying and, and, and the work you're doing in terms of creating some innovative financing models. Um, and just, just to dig a bit more into you know, this year's MB100 and the entries, if we could just go around quickly and just, um, you know, what, what really excited you? What were some of the trends that you drew and, and some of the pieces of innovation or, or ideas that, um, that you particularly liked? And, and maybe, Kimberly, if we, if we start with you. Yeah, I want to pick up on something that Nuru said. Um, I think what was exciting to me is to see breakout across you know, or out of traditional categories. So rather than just healthcare or waste management, one that really stood out to me was social care in Nigeria, which is basically you know taking everything from you know waste management and applying recyclables uh, and collections towards health insurance premiums which is life changing game changing and so smart and so innovative you know it's good for the the communities it's good for livelihoods it's good for the environment and it's providing social protection and, and health safety nets and you know, this goes to, you know, infant mortality and all kinds of different things. So how exciting is that? You know, more of that sort of thinking. And, and I guess this goes to what you were um, saying, Nuru, about you can't talk about the environment without talking about people. They're, you know, inevitably connected and having um, spent time um, in Nigeria and South Africa and seen firsthand some of the challenges with, you know, the waste management and the livelihoods that, that people are trying to to claw out of that, I just think it's a fantastic model. And, and there were several examples like that this year that I just think we need more of those and that kind of thinking cross, you know, cross across categories, not just circular economy, but through different thematics and how um, you can help people in many different ways. Mike, if I can come to you. Yeah, I mean, just brilliant insights shared there. And I just want to pick out three very briefly. I mean, this point about people, the social dimension of the, the net zero transition is utterly crucial. We're already seeing a backlash in many parts of the world because it feels technocratic and distant and something for the elites and the billionaires. It has to feel real to people in their everyday lives. And I don't care whether your everyday life is in Africa or Europe, it has to feel real and beneficial. 
The second thing is, we already mentioned it, the, tech, the use of tech for good. At the moment, the technology revolution is quite dark. It takes us into some hacked elections, you know, spreading rumor and, and misinformation about everything from vaccines to the climate crisis. But technology used for good could be an enormous, powerful force for change. I saw this in African Marks and Spencer supply chain. The, individual, the power of individual farmers is transformed when they know what the weather is going to be, what the price in the marketplace is, yeah. what best practice in terms of managing their farm is. Empowered by one device. And, uh, and, and I guess the, the third thing I'm seeing out there is this point about delivery. And again, I, th I think that is such an important word. If you look what happened at COP26, we got at last, after 26 years, the right words on a piece of paper, which is 1% of the journey to actually create a net zero future for us. 99% of it is action on the ground. And the ability to have delivery partners who can just do it in every community, every village, every city, every town is vital. So the three big things I took from it, critical. And, and Sneed, I'm sure that last point resonated with, with you and, and, and your work. Yes, no, absolutely. I think um, in the in the entries, um, so I was looking at the people focused um, entrepreneur entries and one of the key trends that I focused was there was so much interesting stuff happening for women by women, um, especially in financial financial solutions um, space. Um, in fact, diversity in general came out to be a you know a strong trend. Um, we had some uh, entries which were working on transgender healthcare. Uh, we had entries which were working for solving the transportation problem for women um, in places where you, you know some of the statistics and data that you know, some solutions were not that innovative, but the need was so acute that that solution made so much sense to it. So I think for me, the highlight was, and the feminist in me applauded the entries because I was very, um, you know, I, I like the trend when women take up the challenges and say, you know, we are going to solve other women's problems. Uh, we're not gonna wait for, for the world to, to do that. So, so for me, I think that was one of the biggest and the happiest trends that I saw. So thank you, Tom. Thanks, Dida. And, and finally, Nuru, I know you touched upon some of the trends already, but were there, were there any specific ideas that you, you liked? What I liked for me was there were entries from countries I usually don't think about when it comes to sustainability. So Lebanon, um, there was uh, New Zealand, uh, there was South Central Asia, Bhutan. As a country, I had to Google, where is it? Um, so, so I think that was nice. It was refreshing. Of course, a lot of the very strong entries in my planet category were from the obvious, Sweden, um, the US, the UK, but it was really nice to see the countries that you typically don't think about innovating and leading in that space. And it really gave me a sense of confidence that, and I felt good after reading all the entries, I felt like the world is not that dark and it's not that hopeless. I felt so empowered and inspired uh, by, by all the entries I read. We have a shot at this issue of sustainability and addressing climate change. Thank you. I agree. And that, that's, that's what we want to hope, that's what we hope to achieve with, with, with our community. Um, back over to you, Laura. Yeah, so and I suppose on that brighter note, um, we'd love to find some inspiration for you from you, given obviously the wealth of uh, experience that you bring. But what would your one piece of advice be to these impact focused leaders from around the world as we move into this decade of action? And who would like to go first? Mike, are you up? <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the crucial thing we start to discuss here is about democratization. It's for the people, by the people, for women, by, by women. And I, th I think at the heart of this, what, what a lot of ethical eco um, entrepreneurs forget, the product or the service that they develop and sell has got to be customer centric. So it can win all the awards behind the scenes for ticking all the right life cycle assessment boxes, and SDG boxes, but it's actually got to be something that feels beneficial and useful to people, to communities, et cetera. And what I, what I saw in the, in the things that I looked at was, was really customer centric. It was about developing products that make people's lives better and happier generally, but also underneath it, deliver the SDGs. And those two sides of the same coin for me are critical. Okay, so to keep that front of mind. Uh, who would like to go next, Nuru? 
No, thank you. I, I I really was. I feel like I'm a participant. I'm really listening to everyone. Like I'm a participant, <laughs> but um, I would say um, one thing is to encourage uh, everyone uh, on the fact that sustainable business models can be profitable. I think a lot of us might hesitate. We're hearing about a lot of recovering bankers in the room, uh, myself included. Sustainable business models can be profitable. The other uh, re recommendation I would make is we need to share our stories more. Uh, I've mentored a number of social impact entrepreneurs and they don't tell their stories enough. I think these types of platforms like Meaningful Business are important to get your story out there. I mentioned cross Cross collaboration is so important because the technology you're innovating can work and be replicated and scaled in many different sectors. Um, and when you start hitting that wind, um, you then would be attracting the finance and investment that you're looking for. So I think that's what I would say. Thank you. Lots of helpful golden nuggets there. Um, Kimberly, um, any thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, I want to go back to what I spoke about at the beginning on making it, I'm going to, to flip it from the impact leaders who are trying to help in this space, whether it's from a corporate responsibility or ESG. I think the models are maturing and we need to look at some of the models from other sectors. I was an investor in 500 startups, which gave small amounts of money to lots of ventures and then, you know, followed on, you know, where's the model like that for this sector? We need to take more risk. We need to give more rope to the entrepreneurs that are trying to do more of the challenges that may not be profitable in the sense that we're used to. We need to come up with different measures of what profitability looks like. And the healthcare, um, the health insurance exa example I gave is one that it'd be great to see someone like EY pull apart and say, what is the value add there? What is the, the value of a life saved or a livelihood created as opposed to does that health insurance premium create a profit? And so if we move to the next stage of maturity on ESG investments and how corporates can help in this space, let's start a pooled fund. Let's start 500 startups for social entrepreneurs in some of these spaces where the model is different and we need to sit together and create a new narrative because often they're sent out to knock on doors that they're never going to be let in. They're not going to get a, a traditional impact investor investing in them. It's a waste of everybody's time, yet we're forcing them to do that. And the example I gave of this entrepreneur, you know, he basically spent all of his money and it nearly didn't happen. How many ventures did we not see even get to this point because we didn't support them? So we, it's on us as an, as an impact community, all of us, to sit together and create that new funding model because that is the thing I hear over and over that is the key to success or not. The ideas are there. We need to support yeah. them. Increased appetite for risk, look at it longer term plays, lots of these things. Yeah, no, I think that's very valuable. Snigda? Any thoughts to add from your side in terms of words of advice or wisdom you'd like to impart? <laughs> That's so much already said. Let I know. <laughs> me, let me say, uh, let me give two very simple and practical um, pieces of advice to the people who are attempting to do to do well. Uh, one is, and I know it's it's um, everyone says that, but I also know it's easier said than done, and that is record everything. Every data is important, success or failure, every piece of um, data that you're recording. And from day one, because after three years, when you realize that, okay, something is working, you have nothing to show to the world, even though you've like busted yourselves for three years. So record everything from day one. And the second one I would say, and that's from my experience, do not get disheartened when you think that impact isn't happening because it takes a very long time. So keep at it. Impact yeah. doesn't happen overnight. Oh, well, yeah. I think that's lots of words of encouragement and support um, for us all to consider. So thank you very much. And I will hand over to Tom. Thanks, Laura. We, we, we've got a few minutes left. Um, so, and, and some of this will be discussing in, in the other sessions, uh, particularly around partnerships. But Mike, I just want to ask you, you know, after your, your time at, at Marks and & Spencer's and, and, and how, how you how you thought about partnering with the entrepreneurial ecosystem because i think we're, we're seeing lots of our entrepreneurs within m100 think about how they can work with corporates so what, what was your experience around that so uh, it, it was really interesting because i think at the start of the sustainability journey businesses are, big businesses are very cautious you know the, you know they want to control things they think they have the, all the answers and they probably do for the first 20 or 30 percent of the journey to become sustainable but it's not a linear journey it's an exponential one 
And the last 60 or 70% of the journey are all about bringing solutions into your business that don't exist there and frankly, across the wider big marketplace right now. So I think businesses have been very cautious, big businesses until recently about venturing and incubating. Now they're starting to. Now, I think that's got great strengths and it's got one or two weaknesses as well. I mean, it brings a pathway to scale for these entrepreneurs very rapidly to work with some of the world's biggest companies to sort of expand it. But it also brings, a, you know, you lose some control in terms of working with big business as well. And you have to be very careful that you protect yourself and your IP in terms of um, scaling it like that. But I'm seeing more and more, I mean, we've seen it with um, AB InBev, you know, it's got its 100 plus accelerator uh, platform as well. And I'm seeing more and more of that from big businesses starting to really test radically different ways of doing business for the future. Because what the one thing we're all sure about is that the economy in 2030 will not be iteratively less bad than today. It'll be dramatically better. It just has to be. And I want entrepreneurs to be welcomed with open arms by big businesses. And my final point is just not just about entrepreneurs, but intrapreneurs. So what I saw in the judging was, again, an increasing number of high-powered executives from big incumbent businesses that were willing to step forward and imagine radically changing their business from within as well. And I want to salute them as well on this journey. And Nuru, are you seeing that same uh, increased collaboration in, in Africa and in your work with the, with the Kenya Bankers Association? I think where I'm seeing uh, the collaboration change, the approach is on the development finance side. Uh, before it was a scramble for Africa uh, in terms of DFIs scrambling uh, and distorting the market actually um, to some degree. But what has happened because of COVID, there is more alignment. I think the development institutions are remembering what their mandate is, development, not returns. Um, and they're now working together. So there's more collaboration on the DFI side. We're seeing more um, organizations like MasterCard Foundation, Gates Foundation, really getting into the impact investment space. And that's also changing the social investment approach, which I think is also very good. Um, lots of introduction about different models, social impact bonds and things like that, I think that are being advanced by DFIs and uh, uh, your traditional donor organization. So that, that, that's the collaboration I'm seeing. Yeah, thank you. Perfect, and, and, and Kimberly, maybe if we could just end with, if there's any of the, you know, the interesting fund, funding models that you're seeing, is there any that you can provide an example of that you think is working right now or are they still kind of in, in development? I think that they are in development. Um, I think, and I think we need, as a, it's a bit of a call to action on this one, we need to pull, um, I guess, a cross sector of, of groups together. Sometimes the DFIs are too large for this space. And what I'm talking about is the pipeline building to get them to the stage that they're investable. And so um, creating something for that, that stage of development, because I think as someone just said, and, and the Center for Global Equality that I chair, backs ventures that take quite a long time. You know, it's not going to be done in an eight week or a 12 week challenge. Some of these technologies, Waterscope is, is a good example, working on low cost, you know, high quality water testing technology. These are PhDs that are working on this for years and it will be game changing. But the scramble that we put them through is unfair and it takes time away and it slows everything down. So we need to sit together um, as a cross sector of, of bankers and, and corporates and entrepreneurs and say, what are the problems? What can we build together? And then, you know, build a better mousetrap because it's time for that. It doesn't exist yet. Well, I think that is a brilliant call to action and way to, to end this session.